Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Been a week since we last spoke to you. Hope you and yours are well. It's great to have you back. Um, and we've got today a, a very special guest with someone who's been on here but not for a long while on the Prism Show. Uh, and I'm delighted to to welcome a very popular SNP MP um, who is uh, the, the member for, well, I've got to get my pronunciation right here, it's very embarrassing for a McLeod. Nah, nah, Helen, nah, how, how close was that? Uh, Naming it in here, very, very close, sorry. Very yeah, well, it's very, but my, my mother's family are from North East. Okay. Um, and my father, she and my grandmother was a McDonald, my grandfather obviously a McLeod, and then my, my father was also a McLeod. But he was from Sutherland, and they were they were uh, they were Gales. But the, my father had wouldn't allow get the Gaelic to be spoken in the house. But that's another oh, story for another day. Yeah, okay. um, well now, eh? yeah. Well, I'm really so annoyed about that, and and it's and I'm, I'm embarrassed here that as a man with roots to the the Hebrides, I can't even pronounce it properly. But anyway, welcome. Uh, as I say, it's been a long while since you were on Angus. Last time we were just audio. We didn't. We yeah, didn't, it's been a while. You're right. Yeah. yeah thank, you, thank you for having me back. Oh, no, thank you for turning up and being here. It's really good. Um, and a great place to start, actually. I'm going to quote you, if I may, from today. Oh, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've got to quote you, and it's, it, was a, a, it resonated with me, because I've had on, we've had Alf Baird on recently, we've had um, uh, talking about, you know, referendum and, uh, and franchise, and I've had the SSRG guys on, David Henry, Mark McNaught, um, and so it's something that really takes with our with our, uh, our viewers. Uh, but you said today, and it's so true, uh, I quote your tweet, a speech that could have been made almost any week in 2021 by a pro-independence devolved Scottish government, enough is enough, I'm now putting Scotland on a pro-independence and referendum footing. Um, which seems a fine place for us to start. Um, if we needed any more excuses to get out of Westminster, they've certainly given us some stuff again this week. Was that what inspired you to say that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was those periods over uh, in lots of 2021 where I used to say, you know, any time now you could just press the accelerator on independence because uh, what Westminster is doing, uh, whether it be the, the universal credit, uh, it's cut ta uh, cut the borders of nationality bill even the, this week in the politics, or just the, the general uh, carry on with Downing Street, the Prime Minister, and one rules for for them and other rules for, for, for the plebs, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as plebs. Uh, I think the opportunity is there at almost any time uh, to to change tack with what Westminster is doing and to say uh, that's it, uh, this far and no further. Uh, and I think you know we, rather than complain, Westminster are doing bad things to Scotland. You know, you don't, we don't hear the Irish uh, government complain about it. Um, they get on; they're governing Ireland. Uh, and any time they've got trouble with Westminster, they bring in their twenty six allies in the European Union. And mm -hmm. you know. Westminster will be very silly to invoke uh, Article 16, uh, for instance. But even if they do, they're still within the framework and they're being controlled uh, by the protocol which sits within the withdrawal agreement. But mm -hmm. back to Scotland, um, yeah, I mean, this week, and there'll be something else happening next week, and, oh, sure. happening week after, and you can just say, enough is enough. Uh, from now on, I'm putting Scotland on, a, on an independence and referendum footing. And that's mm -hmm. a speech that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's any time... We'd have won. We'd have won independence in May had the election been used for that. The numbers mm -hmm. show that uh, in the votes and on the on definitely the seats. Very, very easy to see on the seats. Uh, and Boris Johnson achieved his Brexit, having ready deal, and an awful lot less. Um, but you know, if if we do put Scotland on an independence referendum footing, um, we will whenever the the event comes. I mean, probably the referendums would be blocked anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do need ballot box permission from the people, but. When we get that ballot box permission, uh, we'll probably be in a good place for independence. So we just have to get ourselves going. But we can't continue if referendums are going to be blocked. We can't continue to block elections ourselves. Is part of the argument I have too. I yeah. should probably I know. Oh yes, I know. I mean, but the, the fact is, uh, Angus, from 1934 till 1999, the SNP policy was simply, um, you know, a, a majority of seats at Westminster is a declaration of independence, not. Not we'll, we'll have a wee chat about it in a, a referendum. It was no, that's a declaration. 
Absolutely. Um, and I, I call that the Salmonite doctrine, the change yeah. that, uh, that, that came. And I'm just surprised that the SNP leadership now cleaved to the Salmonite doctrine, which have, was uh, the referendum. Of course, uh, there are good reasons that Alex Salmond did that at the time uh, and pulled that uh, idea together. It was to sort of to decouple the, the, the fears, because very often in life when you're combining things, it's difficult to achieve them all. So you, you achieve them step by step. So Alex Hammond used the device of decoupling that uh, to get uh, to get the SNP into power and to prove credibility with a view to moving to independence. And indeed, he, he's he almost achieved that, if you like, but when the referendum of, of 2014. Uh, but now, if referendum doors are closed, I think we have to uh, decouple ourselves from the Salmonite uh, doctrine of uh, we can only become independent at a referendum. Yep, I agree. With you. I remember it very well. I, I mean, I'm always was in the fundamental side of the party, and uh, I remember in ninety nine. Maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was. Uh, I was really against devolution when it came again because I, I was still hurting from seventy nine. I remember that that was horrific, and it was Alec that convinced us to be saying that. You know, we go on. We'll shoot. We'll get government. Um, we'll govern well, and that will give the Scottish people confidence. And it was like one of those Billy Connolly things. And, you know, he's right. You know, again, he's right. Um, but he too has changed his position now. He's back. He's now saying quite rightly that that plebiscite election is the way to go. He's not shouting for a referendum. The, the Alaba Party are saying that it should be in the ballot box the way I believe. Because that's what I want to actually hear. You're here to tell us your plan B. Because I know you've been trying for about five years now <laughs> to get your plan B discussed. The floor is yours, young Mr. McNeil. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, before the 21 election, I mean, I, I tried with much success, and indeed Chris McElhenney, who's uh, since left for the Alba Party, to try and get us to use um, an election, to actually test. I mean, I was I was quite happy to tell let the referendum stuff run its course. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we had run its, its, run its course to an extent uh, in that we knew the Section 30 door was firmly shut in the Scottish Government's face several times. Mm -hmm. We only had to legislate for it and test it in the Supreme Court. And that probably is still the last hurdle to sort of, to be absolutely sure. But I mean, I think the feeling is uh, that given the two things that were struck down on the UN rights of the child, and I think it was a, a local government uh, right or act as well, uh, that was struck down the Supreme Court towards the end of the summer, the early autumn there, uh, that basically, um, if the Scottish government uh, does uh, legislate for an independence referendum, it too is going to be uh, struck down. Uh, and I think, you know, Michael Russell's 11-point plan, the, what some people criticise as a very long plan, uh, and point 10 uh, had a sojourn to the Supreme Court. Now, if you're doing that, uh, and Michael Russell told me three times you couldn't guarantee a referendum in this parliament, if you're doing that, um, you do need to have some backup. And my criticism of the 11-point plan isn't that it's too long. It's, it's clearly too short. Uh, because once you go to the Supreme Court, what's your plan if the Supreme Court says no? Well, the plan yeah. has to be that you're going to use elections. And, you know, if you threaten Westminster that you are going to use an election, uh, they may well uh, ensure that your referendum they're calling for happens because they might prefer to have the fight on independence at a one-off referendum well, rather sure than annual elections every five years because if you get this on the election territory uh, you get the next election in 2026 which I, which I dubbed before the 21 election as the probable 2021 election for slow learners um, mm -hmm. but you get the fight in, in in 2026 and let's say for those who are very fear to having the referendum in case independence loses then you another bite of the cherry in 2031 and in 2036 yeah but <laughs> I just had a wee chat on any time well, you and I had a wee chat on Twitter about it, but I said, well, why not 2024? Because, I mean, as I go back to, from 1934 to 1999, it was to be at Westminster. Now, my contention is that we could do it 24, then 26, then, you know, all along. But the other thing, from the point of view of having it at Westminster, is that they'll be so busy, the unions will be so busy fighting for the crumbs of Westminster to get their, bo their seat in the big boys' chair, that they won't have the same time to devote attack in Scotland um, if it's a standalone, if it's a Holyrood election with nothing happening in England, or if it's a, a, a binary choice referendum, they'll be too busy trying to get the, you know, the 316 seats or whatever it is you need to be the Prime Minister of England. Um, to yeah. vote. So I would go for 24. Why not? Have you a reason yeah. why we shouldn't? Um, well, I think this is something, this is why we should have debates. 
Um, and I'll give you my, my instinctive uh, approach to, to the 24 Westminster thing. First is the franchise. That starts at 18 rather than 16 for the, for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and secondly, if you achieve a majority in the Scottish Parliament, it's pretty clear cut. Having a majority at Westminster, even if it's a majority of Scottish MPs, um, might be a more, more fraught argument than a parliament you control. Uh, but, you know, that, that doesn't mean to say that just because I can't see the way through with that one doesn't mean that somebody else can. But that's why we have a debate. And that's why if, as you've, as you've said, happened in your own uh, political involvement, that you change your mind when the sort of the argument and the facts appear mm -hmm. uh, to, to change. Uh, if we had it now, Boris would be no situation to fight uh, if it was coming up, if a referendum was coming up. In fact, the, the election we gifted Boris two years ago had we held on to that now, would, man, Boris would be gone. You know, that 80 seat oh. majority, that Christmas present we gave Boris in 2019. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose something else, maybe at the bottom of your thing, an argument uh, to add to yours. You know, when you had the right words at the start of the Scottish Parliament that it was hereby reconvened. Yeah. But it's arguable that it wasn't actually the Parliament that left off in 1707. This is a Parliament that is still, as we can see very clearly, a creature of Westminster, power devolved as power retained, mm -hmm. uh, high Supreme Court fetters. Um, so, yeah, you can see you can see from your case that the maybe the those guys who are the heirs, if you like, the political heirs of the 1707 parliamentarians are those mm -hmm. down at Westminster. And perhaps to be brutal about it, that Tony, Tony Blair was also correct that at Holyrood, it's only a parish council. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, unless they step up to the plate and prove otherwise, they're getting treated like that, certainly, by Westminster. Uh, and by the rest of the world, they're seen as invisible. Um, mm. So, you know, th there's sort of a, several harsh um, questions or ideas to sort of put forward to our own side as well about you know what is going to happen, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm still with my bias at the moment, Roddy. I've heard your argument, but I'm still with my bias. Uh, but this is what debating arguments about the majority, <laughs> majority and, the, and the franchise in the parliament that we go for the Scottish Parliament. Because even though it's not arguably the heir of the 1707 Parliament, it is seen by the Scottish people as such. And a referendum that has been held, um, or a plebiscite that's been held through the Scottish Parliament, will be seen as legitimate. And all you've got to do, really, is establish legitimacy with the people. And if the people want independence, you know, people talk about UDI and whatever. It wouldn't be UDI. <laughs> Westminster, and I know a lot of Tory MPs and Labour MPs would accept it. Uh, and in fact, Boris wouldn't uh, do the opposite, which would be his own UDI, a unilateral denial of independence. And that's the UDI that we should worry about, or, or he should worry about. We shouldn't be worried about once the people say yes, I mean, the world will just accept it then, unless uh, people want to ape the likes of Lukashenko in Ukraine or Donald Trump who thinks that the people don't matter, but their diktats and denials do. Hmm. Well, I go back, there's one of my uh, um, commentators or, uh, in my, my blog post um, keeps coming up and saying, well, no, this is not um, an English parliament and Scotland are not a colony. Because people you know, people say, well, if we're not a colony, why do we have to ask for a referendum? Um, but the, her contention is that you and every other Scottish MP should be sitting with the Labour Party sit because it's the Parliament of Scotland and England, and she says, you know, we should be. It should be the equality. So that is where people say, no, that's where we we joined there as our commissioners took us there. Um, we should maybe re rename our members of Parliament commissioners, and it should be them that would draw us from it. If it was good enough for us to send them down to Westminster to join the union, why not do it there to to leave the union? So basically, our, our contention is that we're of numbers, so forget the numbers in the Westminster Parliament, that it's not an incorporating union, but it's a, it's a union of equals yes. uh, on, that, on, on that basis, regardless of how many are on each side. Where if, if the UK goes into a treaty with the European Union and there's only uh, 60 million in the UK, but there's 500 odd million or, or just under that in the European Union, they, they meet each other as equals, uh, which is, is essentially the way the European Union treats its trade partners, be the New Zealand or be the, the UK. Uh, third country. So, that, in other words, Scotland wouldn't be um, uh, discriminated against because of population. It would be treated as an equal to come to the table to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think that enough people are at that stage at the moment to sort of... <laughs> no, no, they're not. I agree. And I mean, one of the problems was, if we go back without going too far, you go back in history, when they went down there in 1707, 
the commissioners had been bailed out by the English um, from their Darien experience. And while these people, so they just thought, well, you know, we better just keep quiet. And then the 1715 rebellion, they thought, well, we better keep quiet. We don't want to get hung, drawn, quartered, and sent to colonies. And then the 45. And it just came by all those different things. It was accepted that we were a minor partner and we had to just shut up and sit at the back. So there is that that argument. But Well, I mean, after the 2019 uh, election, when we asked for the Section 30 and we're told, no, we did shut up and sit at the back, didn't we? So <laughs> Well, we did, but that's what I, I mean. I, I, I personally, um, I know it's, it's no point looking back, but I mean, in, in 2015, when we went, when you old guys went down, there was 56. Yeah, I was, I remember going down there a few days after it, actually. Um, and uh, but when they turned around and kicked out every amendment, I wish Nicola had picked up the phone and said, uh, You can just stop that for a minute. If you don't start doing some of that, we will be having another referendum as soon as stop treating us like this. We should have used our, our power, our weight. We didn't. But eh, if yeah, I mean, I think hindsight's I'm, a great thing. It's the most exact science going. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard that argument a few times. I mean, and I also hear another argument here is just uh, declare or secede or whatever, UDI or we're leaving the union or whatever. I think whatever we do, we need the permission the of the people, people. people. I agree. I agree. And that would make that would make sort of a bunch of MPs who've just been elected without telling the people what they're going to do, then declaring independence is tricky. Mm -hmm. That's why, I mean, that's why those who tell us we can't use an election, we do anything at all, we, we want a, a, an election. Mm -hmm. um, it is a democracy and we can uh, get the mandate we want from the people or fail to get the mandate, but we can at least try to get the mandate. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if we don't have that, if we don't have permission from the people to do X, it's very difficult then to do X. Correct. That, I, I, I think, you know, speaking academically, we could tomorrow recall all our MPs, have a citizens' assembly, and everyone at we from Westminster and Holyrood could declare, and that would be messy. I understand that. We could, theoretically. Yeah, and, uh, the, and, the, and I, the danger is that the people would turn around and say, what are you playing? Well, we didn't, you didn't let us vote for that. I agree with you. So I agree with you. I'm, on this, we're 100%. We're um, but I, the difference is, I say, I think we should have one policy only in 2024, uh, or one uh, thing inside the manifesto, which is, this is a manifesto, for, for independence, nothing else. It's, so it's unquestionable. But that's a debate. If, if I've got to wait another couple of years, well, I'm getting on, but I think I could hang on another couple of years, but I don't want to indefinitely. But it, well, it, I, I, I think, do you not think it's time that, um, I don't want to put you too much in, in the... I mean, when you're saying this about 2024, Rory, it seems to me that, um, how should I put it, that you're not exactly convinced there will be a, a referendum in 2023. I, I'm, I'm like Stuart Campbell. Any bet that Stuart Campbell's not taking, I'm willing to take. And I think... Um, and I've I just met one of my colleagues uh, this week in five on that one. Yeah, I better I, not say who he is, but I've got it in the diary at the beginning of 2023. I'm going well, to go back I, for, the, for know, my five on. I, you know, my favourite song now is the grand old Duke of York. Um, it's, we've been up and down that hill so many times. But the fact that... Well, I didn't want to be in that position, actually. But the fact that in the, the budget yesterday there was nothing you know, to support that we would be, you know, putting money for the white paper on a bill. The fact is that we know that the last, the latest uh, Freedom of Information says that there's been no work done since March on the referendum, the draft referendum, draft or referendum bill makes me think that, no, there's not going to be one in 2023. And then by 2024, we're into general election territory. Nor do I believe some people say, oh, there'll be a general election in 23. I, I, I would bend to your knowledge as a, a, a long-standing parliamentarian, but why would the Tories, with an 80 majority, want to go early? I mean, what, what would be the point? They've got everything they need with an 80 yeah, majority. Yeah, rationality is, is not always evident in politics. Uh, and I, true, true. That. I mean, somebody was moaning about the Northern Ireland Protocol or the actions of the European Union might not be rational, or UK's or whatever, and Irish government. And well, the whole thing started off as something hugely irrational, Brexit. Yeah, mm -hmm. Given Boris Johnston uh, an 80 majority was an irrational step uh, from our side and the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Think yeah. of that. It was also irrational for, for Jeremy Corbyn to join in once we'd sort of backed off. Uh, but he didn't realise, of course, when he joined in that we'd backed off. And he'd given his word he was voting for an election. He thought, uh, of course, that there was going to be two amendments that day uh, that would that would mean the government would pull the bill. But unfortunately, Lindsay Oil, the then Deputy Speaker, didn't choose the amendments. And um, so the, There's a show. the Christmas present election basically happened when a cock up between Labour Liberals and the SNP, probably. Uh, but, you know, these things happen in politics. But, you know, 
I can't see the 23 referendum happening because there's no legislation going through the parliament at the moment. Exactly. The legislation starts to go through, is then going to go to the Supreme Court eventually when it's through the parliament. How long is it in there? We don't know. It's likely the Supreme Court will say no. Um, you know, and I could be wrong in this. And I, like, this is why we should have a debate. I've, you know, I'm not hearing anything from anybody who says this will all happen, explaining to me how it will happen. I'm including my very own own side in this. It's just that things are happening that you don't know about. And, you know, to be honest, I've heard about the sort of the secret plan for three, four years sort of in the chat. Now, the only secret I've worked out that was on the go was actually there was no secret. And that was the big no. secret. No. Uh, there was nothing else to fall back on. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and uh, I, I think debate is healthy. And I think challenging other people's views are healthy. And, and the First Minister's view that if there's no referendum or if a referendum is denied, the alternative is unthinkable. I would disagree with that very respectfully, of course. But the alternative is just what we've got today, so therefore it is very thinkable. Uh, you know, if, if we can't think about the that we're stuck inside a, a, a four nations, hoping that, uh, or sorry, even four nations, in fact, it's it's, it's three nations and a bit of somebody else's nation. Um, but you know, I, I can't see how, how it was all going to fall fall together, and that's no. why I was mischievously asking you that you didn't believe in a in the possibility of a twenty three referendum. Hopefully, I'm wrong. Uh, and we just have to let it play. Well, uh, but those, those are promising us the 23 referendum. We have to hold their feet to the fire on this. Uh, and then if they don't manage to deliver it, they should be big enough uh, and honest enough to say we can't do this. Uh, not come up with another list of excuses to kick, kick it into the long grass to cock any. In fact, it's about three years since we heard the cock any, the famous cock any statement, you know. Mm, uh, yeah. Convincing people, it's quite insulting. I'll just keep convincing people. What, it's very difficult to convince people when you don't know what you're convincing them about. And there's been no movement on the currency. There's been no movement on a central bank. There's been no movement on borders. There's been no talk of how exactly they're going to get back into the EU or should they go to F to the SIP. So no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Or uh, I'd be so surprised because if nothing else, again, using your experience, Angus, in politics, the most important thing is leverage. What leverage do we have now to force Boris or his successor to agree to a Section 30 referendum? And my answer is, well, we don't have any leverage, none whatsoever. We did when it was Theresa May um, and it was Boris early. We could have said, well, you want your, you want us to support Brexit? I wrote a blog about it and got slaughtered, by the way, saying that we should do a deal to get our referendum um, and, you know, take a few things along the way while of broadcasting. Thank you very much. And... Uh, um, full fiscal autonomy, and you can have your Brexit. But we didn't. But well, we, don't have, we, don't have any, we don't have any leverage now, do we? No, we don't. It's, it's quite an easy answer uh, to that. Absolutely none. You know, if you think about it quite logically, the United Kingdom, uh, its population, Scotland's about 8%, 8.5%, mm -hmm. and about half of Scotland's population want independence, a little over half. Let's be charitable to ourselves. So that gives you about, let's say, 4.5%. 2%, 4.3, 4 4.4%. So 95.5% of the UK's population are unbothered or untroubled by this. You know, the Christmas party in Downing Street causes the Prime Minister an awful lot more bother, evidently, because it troubles the people than the denial of a Scottish referendum, which they do several times. And I think I've asked him a few times. I think also in the chamber that Joe Terry's asked the First Minister. I've asked orally and in letter. The First Minister's asked in letter, certainly, at least twice. Yeah, Boris just shrugs his shoulders, smiles, and tells us all no chance. Um, so, you know, I, we've absolutely no leverage. We know we've no leverage in this. We, I have only asked to sort of, uh, uh, if realising we've no leverage, and rather than waste time, uh, that we get on with it, and we get on with the, what we should have done before the 21 election, that was to legislate, as was said uh, in 2016, uh, just after the Scottish parliamentary election, just after the time of the Brexit referendum, that we would have a referendum in the term of that parliament. Uh, and if we legislated then and been blocked by the referendum, we could then legitimately quite easily to get people to understand why we need to use the why we need to use an election. But we'll get nowhere unless we're prepared to lead uh, mm. and prepared to make the case and make the argument for it. Uh, <laughs> at the moment, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, we are not making the argument for independence. I mean, all over the Western world, there are all sorts of things happening in all sorts of democracies, and the only one I can think of that is stopping anything. In the pandemic is the Scottish government and uh, their continuation with independence. Correct. I mean, I was I was extolling the virtues of Mary Lou Macdonald, who's 
um, very much the tears she had waiting, but um, she's already preparing for a border poll to get the, the Brits out of the six counties. Um, and we're doing nothing. I mean, what I don't understand, and, and what's clear I don't know, with, 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 with two governments on it, and maybe two independent governments, but that's an argument for a, another day. Well, absolutely. Well, book, book them in, Techie, book them in. <laughs> uh, uh, we, you know, why, when the rest of us can see anyone with half a brain with the greatest respect to the First Minister knows that it's not going to happen, why will... Why is she keeping going down this road and saying it's going to be and they'll have to give in and just one more mandate? Surely the time has come now to speak and say, look, let's get together, let's unite, let's have a some kind of convention, you know, like our independence, an independence convention, and let's get all the ideas up. Mine might get kicked out, yours might get kicked out. The Section 30 referendum might win it. But as you say, if we don't all who believe in independence talk about it and come up with some plans. Whatever you're doing in life, business, commercial, politically, you should always have a plan B, plan C, plan D. We don't. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll also, in the number of criticisms there of the SNP, but I'll also include Alipa in that criticism of the election. They were just saying that if we had just more pro-independence MPs than MSP, sorry, Boris would just have to listen. I mean, I think I think more was required than, 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 than that sort of argument. Um, yeah, we've well, got no, a problem. I think, the, I think the argument was that we could have a super majority, which meant then meant that um, you could dissolve the whole Parliament, Parliament at yeah. any time and have a plebiscite at any time. That was the which, argument. Um, which, which that argument wasn't made and understood by the people, because if you ask no, the people, well, because about, well, the read problem, about it, yeah, the, the problem that was, was that Alapa were not getting the the previous people. That's Alapa did have it. They were, I am well, okay, but I don't think that they were, their communications weren't on the button of what should have been uh, there. Very, very but, you know, that you, you, you've spoken about something else that's quite important there, and that's uh, uniting yourselves. That if we do mm -hmm. manage to get a referendum in 23, uh, and we, people like me will have to put our skepticism aside and say, well done to whoever, I, I, I got it wrong. Um, and if we don't manage to get a referendum in 23 and we have to go somewhere else, then other people have to put their views as a skepticism side and say they got it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to be able to sort of unite as a, uh, uh, as a movement and continuing sort of uh, jabbing at each other is probably not the most productive uh, for, for going forward on independence. Um, obviously, we've got, we've got concerns. I think we share the concerns about 23 at the moment. Other people are very confident they can deliver for 23. Uh, they, those other people are in power in the Scottish Parliament, so let's see if they can, and uh, we'll maybe then uh, remind them of the scepticism then. Uh, but the danger is, of course, that like the frog that's boiling slowly, we reach the sort of the middle of 22 and the, Nothing the end of 22, and we say well, we'll just have to push it out a little bit longer, and the things aren't happening. We have to wait for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court comes back sometime in early 23 and says it can't happen. Then, you know, with some sort of tuning and throwing, and we'll, we'll consider it for a number of months. And, you know, we forget when that was said, uh, when nobody diaries it, when they expect it to be, uh, when, a, when a month has passed or when two months have passed. It was a wee bit like the, the promise to, the promise to uh, uh, publish a draft referendum bill in the last Scottish Parliament. I mean, that was gone from a year of that. Yeah. <laughs> that was going to end of 2020. I diaried it, diaried it, and every three months I was going to have that draft, draft bill been published. It was eventually published. I mean, it excited load of a load of activists. I know uh, the publication of a draft bill. I mean, I, c I can't begin to communicate how long the pecking order of things that is. I promise to publish a draft. Uh, and it's not, even, finished. It's not uh, even been through all its all the, the stages. It was published yet. Five weeks before the end of the Parliament. <laughs> I mean, it's like, mm. yeah, and it's now sitting <laughs> gathering dust, doing nothing. It went from near pointless to utterly absurd. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it kept people chipping along, and that's the danger that you know in twenty three that that all those sort of tricks are used, um, and, and you know we can't do that again. And we, we're being we're not being fair to people uh, on the independent side that we're giving them hope by saying we're going to promise to publish a draft bill, you know, either publish the draft bill or don't, but don't announce a promise to publish a draft bill. I mean, come on. Um, so we're. We need to be sure of 23, that those who are saying that we can do this in 23, those who say that, you know, they said before that Boris, Boris would have to listen, and we, we heard it in, on Brexit, clearly that we had no strategy for Brexit. Um, no. I, well, I thought in the beginning we had no strategy for March 2019, but mm -hmm. I figured out towards the end of 2020 we had no strategy either 
after thinking all the eggs were in the December 2020 basket, that we'd no strategy for December 2020. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's obvious. I and mean, it's nothing it's nothing controversial to say that. This is it's patent statement on the obvious of what yeah. happened. So we have to make sure that there's things happening this time because the people want independence. I'm getting I, it's almost like I'm meeting people who I've got to say in 2014 weren't as pushy in Scottish independence or now very pushy in Scottish independence. And probably Westminster realizes this, and this is why every tactic will be used to try and delay, stop, and block uh, the, the, the referendum. And if they're successful, we must let the people speak, and we must stop blocking the use of an election. They, they're the same ballot boxes. They're currently in the same cupboards and councils up and down. They go to the mm-hmm. same polling stations, be manned by the same people. The event is badged differently. One day it's a referendum, still bits of papers and pencils. Other day it's an election. You can still achieve the same things through the ballot box uh, if you prepare to lead and make the argument for it. Well, c- can I ask you the, the, the $64,000 conundrum question? If it's okay to have a holiday general election, and it's okay to have a council election in May. Why can't we have a referendum? Apparently, the first minister says until we've got over COVID and uh, the effects of COVID. That again doesn't make sense. It's like maybe algebra. That's, it's like maybe algebra. that's an argument that Boris Johnson should adopt. We can't change your prime minister in the middle of a <laughs> pandemic. I mean. That's nonsense, obviously. I mean, well, I would, I would, I'd say you can do both. Germany have clearly moved from Mutti yourself, uh, Angela Merkel, mm-hmm. uh, to their new chancellor uh, quite seamlessly and quite well. And I think you can do just about everything you want to, you want to do uh, in this uh, pandemic. And that's maybe the key part that you want to do. Correct, because um, if you can get 50,000, 60,000 at Ibrox and Parkhead crammed in, we can go out and campaign. I mean, it's a... Why the why the first minister saying this? It's it's with the greatest respect. She's insulting the intelligence of the Scottish people to say that because of COVID, it somehow only affects a a, a referendum. That is a nonsense. Maybe uh, maybe it's, maybe it's part. Maybe let's let's try and think this through. If we can be devil's advocate well, for a bit. Maybe, maybe the first minister is maybe more of a uh, on the salmon diet thinking. Um, you no, know, Salmon used, as I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of the, the, the Salmon uh, doctorate of using the, uh, of separating the election from the uh, referendum. Perhaps the First Minister is also following the, the Salmon credibility uh, argument that you establish credibility somewhere and that perhaps she feels that she's being more credible with the people by delaying this uh, during um, the pandemic time rather than pressing on with it. The only difficulty with that is is that then you let the Tories do whatever they want. You block, I know, I know of uh, I know of some uh, MP colleagues who could uh, young family members in European countries who can't stay there for longer than three months and will have to come back. Uh, career damaging stuff. You're, da- you're damaging the life chances of young Scots meantime uh, because you're following this uh, idea. I mean, I think if that was the plan, that you sort of uh, gain some credibility from some of the soft nose they call them, um, then you've done that um, and that has been achieved. Uh, so now that you've got that credibility, you get moving onwards. Uh, and that's why I think I'm prepared to uh, let watch and wait for 23. There's nothing we can do in the meantime anyway. Uh, so we might as well watch and wait uh, for 23. Uh, but then, uh, you know, it's that's then... The time I'll keep putting forward my my motion that you know if 23 is a failure that uh, for the referendum doesn't happen that we use the elections and probably by the SNP conference of 23 it may be it may be clamoured for uh, mm. rather than being booed off stage as it was at one time. Yeah, well, I, I would say that this you know my thing about soft nose, which I think is another red herring. It's as simple as this: after 11 years of Tory austerity, universal credit. You know, all the stuff that's going on, Brexit, if they're still soft nose, they're not soft nose, they're hard nose. Um, and they are not going to be convinced. I think that battle's been won. I think, I honestly do believe the battle's won. It's I think, yeah, I mean, the ballot box with it. I, th- I, think, I think they're not even soft nose. They're, they're not even, they're just the ones who are not paying attention. Hmm. And when the campaign comes along, they're saying whatever at the moment. Chick, chick. Campaign makes people change your mind because you pay attention in the campaign. Because then we're Correct. all making argument. We're all on the same side. Correct. You'll have uh, um, Kenny McCaskill and Neil Hanvey with uh, 
Ian Blackford and well, maybe maybe not those two, but you know what I mean with uh, Joe Cherry or Philippa Whitford or uh, whoever, um, all campaigning very closely uh, together. I, well, why not see Ian Blackford on the, well in the mix? We're going to have to have everybody in the mix with it. So you know, we need to. everybody's going to have to, you know, and they will because the prize will be will be too great. Um, so <laughs> uh, I'm sure they'll all get along just fine, and whatever was said in press releases before will be forgotten about. Well, um, we're coming towards the end here, um, and uh, and I'd like to end on that note about unity because we do before we do anything, Angus, we do need to get the unity back of the entire unit. Now, I know the Alapa Party. This is this is the SNP activist wing. No, so it's not going to take much to get the old band back together again, as um, um, you know. By but it's going to take at the top, at the top, it's going to take to stretch that hand out. Um, we need unity, or we will lose. Whether it be a plebiscite or whether it be a referendum, we will lose if we are not united and all singing off the same hymn sheet. Yeah, I mean, I think you might make a point there. I mean, it was a Churchill that said, be magnanimous in, in victory and gracious in defeat. And I think victory is power. So you want to be magnanimous when you're in power. Uh, and it, it's it's the person or the persons in power uh, that are the ones who've got to be the, the, the bigger partners. It's also incumbent, of course, on those who have the hand stretched out to them to accept it. Um, I, I would imagine that that would happen when uh, uh, the uh, the... Things were in were in action for for the independent ballot box, which whether it'll be a referendum or an, an election. I mean, just one thing I'd like to reiterate, sort of at the end, is that we know we shouldn't worry if it becomes an an election because that then gives the people, you know, there the, there can't be any more once in a generations for elections. Although Boris did say in twenty nineteen the election was a once in a generation, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the people will be asked every five years uh, when it comes to elections. So I mean, it should be a favourable thing for us, but. You know, sometimes some people have set their minds against something, will refuse to debate an argument or discussion or even Zoom meetings or whatever uh, to chew it or to chew ideas around and then set the face against it. Um, hopefully there can be a thawing uh, and an understanding and, a, and an enlightenment uh, that there are other ways uh, possible. But, you know, um, one of the reasons I'm I'm here with, with you tonight, Roddy, is some of the things I've said here is what I would say to an SNP conference if I was allowed to speak on the subject at an SNP conference. Mm. Uh, but every time I motion forward, it's blocked. Uh, yeah. So, you know, well, some I'm, 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 I'm delighted to hear. Sorry, some of the people are arguing against me just now, you know. As I say, the most winning first path. I've took the first past the post seat of Labour in, in 34 years. So I've been at this a while. So I'm not going to be discouraged by, by sort of uh, short term, maybe, um, uh, would it be, uh, would, would, it, would it be so unkind as to say sort of a sectional thinking or, or, or arguing I'll, I'll argue for the uh, for the uh, for the point itself uh, and i'm not too bothered who or what is on what side she's saying whatever but i think you know if we don't say things uh, and can't say things at conference we've got to use other forms to say things well, um, and yeah. i'm not going to be quiet in this because i think the prize is, is too great and we've got to be able to cross-examine uh, our, our leaders as well and to be put put other points to them you know, and if we can't do that in any other forum, then we have to do it quite publicly. Correct, correct. I, I mean, I, I wrote a recent blog, and it was called The Slippery Slope, and it was, you mentioned my great hero from my early days in the party when I was a lad, um, Winnie, Winnie Ewing, um, when she talked about, when Tam Dayel was talking about the slippery slope to independence, and as she said, I'll take Tam's hand here, and I'll take a, I can't remember the Tory she mentioned, and that, and I'll we'll slide down the, the slippery slope together. So... If they think, and, you know, and she also made, she also made the argument for the devolved parliament take half a loaf is better than none. You know, and I, I would make the argument that a devolved parliament is a partially independent parliament, and an independent parliament is a fully devolved parliament. You can well, play around with words and ideas. Well, as we're overrunning, but the, my last, I, I, I'm going to get. Well, not. I'll let you get the last word. Then I'm just say, for the only bit where I disagree with you, um, I think I think we're being agreeing vehemently uh, is the five year gap. I would be every two and a half years. I would be having a plebiscite at both the parliaments. But on that, yeah. I, I could be convinced. I mean, I'll go to an open forum and if they, with the hands go up, if it's, they say every five years and it's Hollywood only, already, I can live with that. I can live with that. But we need a plan. Yeah, and I, I mean, mean just, something. Yeah, so sorry, Rudy, just as you're speaking of that, I mean, when you, when you put it like that and you say, you know, we can use any election and, and we can ask it at every election and also... We have to play fair to, to, to the unionist side. If they say that, you know, 
we, we just have to get lucky once. No, no, once Scotland's independent, if you want to rejoin and be ruled from Westminster again, you can put that uh, thing to the Scottish people. The only thing I'll say is that whether it be Singapore, Ireland, Malta, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, wherever, uh, they don't seem to be very popular, those movements. But nope. those people will have that right after independence. And we've had the right before independence to ask the Scottish people yes. as often as we want. Do okay. they want independence? They can, of course, reject it. Uh, and or they can, of course, accept it. And I believe that uh, sooner rather than later, they will accept it. Correct. As soon as they get out of jail, they can they can have their say. No, I'm only kidding, folks. Don't start writing in. I was only kidding. It was a throwaway joke. Angus, um, muchas gracias. Um, and we will get you back. If, as I say, you've thrown up a couple of other things we could have a long chat about uh, some other occasion. But thanks for taking time out your weekend. And uh, I, I, we do appreciate it. And uh, if we don't jaw, 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 we'll never get it. Jaw, jaw, jaw some more. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma. Thank you, ma. Here we go, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's great. And it's good that um, Angus was uh, from the SNT was was happy to come here. Um, I did, as you know, extend a, an invitation to someone else who, who declined. But to discuss what I've been talking to with Angus, as usual, I have my two compadres who will join me to talk about this and the week's events. And any minute now, Techie will put up the sun, sun-soaked Ian Lawson, uh, the famous oh, Paisley Mohawk and the the Coke Bridge Cavalier there from India. They are old boys. Well, there. Did you enjoy listening to your ex-colleague there, Phil? Your old MP buddy. Excellent, excellent. Angus, uh, Angus Brendan's always been a great talker and and a man who's not frightened to speak his mind. You know, and and but politically savvy enough to know where the lines are, but nonetheless fully aware of his job, which is to bring us and our people independence. <clears throat> so, no, no, I, I love Angus's focus and I love his honesty. Um, doesn't always make him popular with the hierarchy, but sure. uh, he, he made some excellent points. He was yeah. honest and, and, and spoke the truth as he saw it. Without, who can deny? I mean, I, I hate people that pretend when it's so when when something is obvious as that the election in twenty three isn't going to happen, or or or, or all of the, the big list of events that have happened that were promised and you know like fighting Brexit. Why why were we fighting Brexit when it was democratically elected uh, properly by England and, and Wales, and we are trying to fight to prevent the democratic will of the people of England instead of focusing on our needs. You know, no, I, I'm. I've always, uh, I've always uh, admired uh, Angus Brendan for being able to stand up and speak the truth, and um, without without tipping over the edge, you know, without creating havoc, he just he confidently speaks it and he suffers the slings and arrows, but just gets on with it. And uh, we need more politicians like that to be completely honest with you. I agree, and Ian, the, the one thing as I said there at the end, uh, where I and uh, Brendan, uh, Angus Brendan don't agree is I think it should be. This next election, 2024, we should have a plebiscite. I, I, I don't, I don't agree. But as I, as I said, if there's a, some kind of forum and there's a decision taken, I'll go with the de democratic decision. But Westminster is we want to leave, and and I believe that we should go to the people of Scotland and say, this is what we're going to do here. It's in the manifesto. One thing only. What out? What do you say? Well, I mean, I've got great sympathy for Angus Brendan's position because he, you know, he has been a lone voice. Uh, and, you know, he's courageous in what he does. But I was slightly concerned with parts of what he said, you know. Uh, for instance, his argument against uh, a Westminster being the, mm -hmm. being the plebiscite election was that we'd lose the 16 and 17-year-olds. Well, you know, there were 16 and 17-year-olds in 2017. They're now 20 and 21, and they'll be voting. And each year we waste. You know, these 16 and 17 year olds are getting older and older and older. And, you know, there just needs to be a willingness here in Scotland to actually push the envelope a bit mm. uh, and start moving forward. Because, you know, we can talk around this for as long as the, the day is long or, or the night is long. We're not moving forward in the present moment. 
not in any shape or form. And another thing that wasn't discussed, and I think it's absolutely crucial, is the franchise. You know, because you know, you can get the 16 and 17 year olds, but if you haven't sorted that franchise, and this will be proved next year when the census figures come out, there's going to be huge numbers of voters who should not be voting in Scotland's constitutional because they've put no input into Scotland and they've suddenly arrived, you know. Mm. And I mean, we, apart from the referendum issue, apart from independence, there's a huge issue now in Scotland about where are young people who have lived in an area for their, you know, their family's been there for generations, how they can afford to purchase homes in the same area, how you staff cafes, restaurants, other businesses in these own areas, because there's no housing. You know, the housing's been bought by people from down south. This is a huge political issue, and it's directly related to the need for a referendum or, uh, you know, a plebiscite election. I believe, and you know, the discussion about there being no leverage is wrong. There is leverage. The minute you dis de declare that the next general election will be a plebiscite election, that's when you've got your leverage. Westminster will come back at that point insistent that you follow a Section 30 route in a referendum because that gives them a far greater chance of winning yeah, yeah. than a general election. And, we, you know, we know that, they know that, and the way to force them is to absolutely make clear that if we haven't, you know, got the franchise sorted, if we don't have a fairer franchise, if we don't have a Section 30, then the route is a plebiscite election in 2023. Let me be very clear here. If it's a, if it's a plebiscite election for Westminster, they're entitled to vote. Absolutely entitled to vote. It's if it's a, a binary referendum, you've got to look at the franchise. Is that is that your point? Are you saying for both? No, 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 I have no problem because they can vote in 2023, but the decision will be made on 26. seats. Oh, well, 24, no, 24, 24, 24. 24 right. will be made on seats. Yes. You know, and of course they can vote. You know, they're perfectly entitled to vote, but the decision on whether we go for independence will be a majority of seats. Yes. One in Scotland. Yes. You know. But now, they can vote. Know, they can vote in that, yeah. Of course they can. Of course yeah. they can. I've got no problem with that. But that, that's much better than the, what the Holyrood route would be. The Holyrood route, you know, you're into a much tighter result at the end of the day. Binary. Done in votes. You know, I mean, and the franchise is out the window. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely out the window. So, I mean, I, I, my preference is strongly for a plebiscite election in 2024 or any general election that may thereafter. occur before that. There, and thereafter, yeah. everyone. Yeah. 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 Uh, Phil, the other thing, Brendan, Angus Brendan, he, you know, he couldn't come right out and say it's a load of tosh. And he's, he's, he said the same. There's not going to be a 2023 referendum. There's nothing in place. You've heard it from Angus. There's nothing in place that makes this possible. And yet... Nicola Sturgeon and Ian Blackford and um, Mike Russell, um, breaks my heart that, um, are still pushing this myth, which is just lying to the people. And they're complaining about Boris Johnson telling lies and not being truthful and transparent with the people. They're not being transparent. There is not a chance of a 23 referendum, is there? Well, this is what's the, the most worrying. Um, no, there isn't. It's not going to happen. And that would make it 10 years since the 2014 NDRF won. And, you know, I, I, I did a quick calculation based on the demographics after that hollowness we all felt when we lost in 2014. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, and it was quite cold and calculated. I thought five years and two cold winters, given the demographics of 65 pluses and um, uh, 70, 72% with the under 18s. I thought, you know, just do this. Do the simple mathematics, the simple arithmetic, and that's all we need. And that's without Brexit and without Boris. And we are now in a situation where, I, what what is now jumping out at me is is the most worrying demographic. Going back to what uh, we were talking about earlier, isn't isn't that demographic that I calculated back 
five years ago. It's the one that came out um, when we, that are still, we're pushing this Section 30 strategy. And the fact that the polls, the exit polls, showed that the biggest group of no voters were non Scots. And given that we'll get 50,000 exactly. 50, incomers every year, and the Scottish population is decreasing substantially, so the Scots are uh, one of the least regularly reproducing um, peoples in Europe. It, it, I mean, the, 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 the rates of reproduction in Europe, you need about a 2.3 average, 2.3 kids per couple. Hmm. Because to, to, to just maintain to maintain the levels, most most European countries are about 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, and the only reason our population is staying stable or increasing is through incomers. Now, there's something else I would I would recommend people check out. There was a brilliant program by we know Alf Baird very well. We know what he's been talking about in Mark um, uh, on building the Scottish State Show and Independence Live. It's it's they absolutely nail it. And there's something that um, Alf talked about. And he said, reading the literature on independence, on col colonialisation, and particularly the C24 group from um, the European Union, he said that governments, or effectively departments, devolved governments, make an accommodation with the colonial master. And what they end up doing is kicking the can down the road they kick the can down the road, they attack the more radical elements of the independentistas and withhold independence. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, well, so. radical covers me. But just it brings me, if I could, Ian, it brings me on to something there that um, uh, Phil was talking about, about you know, how we're not reproducing enough, which maybe we've been unfair to the SNP about the sex survey that's been causing a stir this week. Maybe this is part of the plan to get the Scottish male and young males and females breeding more. But um, that, you know, it's these things like that survey, which is deflecting away from the what we should be doing, GRA deflecting away from what we should be, when we should be concentrating on the Constitution. Everything else should surely be behind, below and a lower priority, Ian, and it's not... Well, you're bang on. You're exactly right. And I would suggest one of the reasons that we don't have a great reproduction rate is the fact that we're not independent. We lose enormous numbers of young people, you know, at the end of their school mm -hmm. years. They go yeah, up yeah. elsewhere Markets. Markets. To, find, to find employment. And, you know, that, that has consequences. You know, and if you go back to the start of the union, I think there was about uh, four English people for every one Scot when the union was created. Mm -hmm. Now that's hugely expensive. Nice yeah. you, you know, exactly. You know, so uh, there's got to be a reason for that. And I think, to me anyway, the reason's patently clear that we have not very little, uh, you know, hold on our young people. They're attracted away because we ourselves are a colonised nation. And I know it's not popular to describe Scotland as a colony. But all the statistics, all the history of the Union very much support the view that Scotland is a colony. Mm -hmm. And we need our people to have the realisation that that is the case because there's some still under this misapprehension that we're equal partners in this Union and that everything's uh, shining light when the experience and the statistics and the information, if you only make a small effort to check it out, confirms that we are a colony and we're in run like a colony. And Al Baird has been consistently writing this throughout. I mean, his papers explain it perfectly. And when you read them, you think, does this ring true to Scotland? And of course it does. Mm -hmm. The yeah. colonizer, admin, the colonial administration is the last people we should be looking for to deliver independence. They're in no hurry. They're enjoying it as it is. They yep. have power and no responsibility and always someone else to blame. Yeah, there's a hell of an article about that today. But the other one is that while all this is going on, the, the, the nonsense down, in, which I went on to talk to with Angus to start with about the party that wasn't, that was really a party and the guy, one of the guys that was at the party is now investigating to see if there was a party. I mean, it, it's just insulting. But anyway, 
what were our people doing? Instead of preparing for independence, they were, Hollywood was talking about they want Team GB to um, boycott the Beijing um, Winter Olympics because of the, the human rights uh, record of the Chinese. <laughs> this is the same government that's going to stop us protesting outside our own parliament. Who, who are wanting to jail women for saying, well, I don't want a man in my safe space. You're going to jail. That's a hate crime. And they're complaining about the Chinese. Go on, give us a laugh. Um, but the other thing that's getting me is that some of our biggest supporters in the independence movement are the Asians for Independence, and now the Indian Council um, for Scotland are coming behind the, the independence uh, bandwagon. But here we have this nationality in Borders Bill going through Westminster, uh, Phil, which could remove their... Um, even if they've been here for 50, 60 years, even their second generation, they could be booted out if they commit a crime, if they get caught demonstrating against the government or doing anything that the government doesn't like. They can, without notice, reduce, remove their um, their citizenship and kick them out of the country. Absolutely appalling. I mean, it, it goes against everything that is about the, the Scottish culture and our principles and our values. This is the opposite, exact opposite. The right-wing radicals in England have taken over. They're running the show. And sadly, our government, our government's behaving complicitly. We mm -hmm. see, see, we talked about the sex survey, the disingenuousness of the First Minister saying... She didn't actually say it was confidential, the sex survey. She says it will be used confidentially. But the kids have got to put their candidate number. She says it's an mm -hmm. option. You can you can opt in or opt out. They've got to put their candidate number. Their candidate number. I, I, I lectured at university and we use the candidate number to identify the student. You never put the name. They don't put their name on their test papers mm -hmm. so there's no prejudice. But the candidate number is the number by which you identify the child or the individual to whom the mark goes to. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you add it to all the rest of the stuff, the big list you come out with, shouting about the Chinese. And and, and there was I saw some stuff on, on Twitter today about, you know, Nicola, you, you're all wrong, I'm right. <laughs> uh, going ahead with the sex Again. survey. Uh, <sighs> it's like, well, I mean, who's, it's, author uh... who's authoritarian here? Hmm. Yeah, you know it's going to be rubbish as well at the end because, you know, if you know anything about teenage life or young people of that age group, a huge number of boys are They're going lying. to claim to be sexually active. Errol Flynn. A, a, smaller, not, a much smaller number of girls will fill it in, you know. Yeah. It's the old story about computers, you know. Rubbish in, rubbish out. Correct. You know, so it's, it's completely practical. I mean, every school as guidance teachers. And if a child isn't concerned about any of these issues and doesn't want to discuss it for whatever reason mm -hmm. with their parents, they have the option of going and talking to a guidance teacher and getting some, you know, sensible adult advice on what they should do at, at that point. Now, you're bypassing all that with this sort of survey, you know, and you're also introducing ideas. I mean, when I was 13 or 14, I had no idea what anal sex was. Now, of course, the, the, the wokey folk nowadays will say, well, you should have. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I think that comes with maturity as you go older and you experience a bit of life. What we're trying to do here is rush these young children into sexual activity. And it's a complete mistake. Hmm. But the other thing is, Ian, when, as you say, the, the boys, we all did it, the boys will exaggerate and tell lies. And that's of course the, And the government will use that side. See, 97% of the boys have had uh, sexual intercourse, anal, vaginal and, and oral, 442 times each in the last five years. So we were right to do this. Exactly. I mean, it's just an absolute... But the, the Children's Commissioner said, no. First Minister, hold this. The Roman Catholic Church said, no, we don't like this. The Indian Council for Scotland said, oh, hold on. Some of these questions are a wee bit too much. But oh, no, Nicola knows best. Uh, and she knows better than anyone. And she goes, that, that way she goes, oh, she's out of order. It is out really of out of order. And eight, eight councils have said, we're not comfortable with this. And what got me was the one Chris McIlvenny talked about. Um, when he was put, discussing it with Inverclyde Council, they said, well, you can't read these questions out. These are quite offensive. <laughs> Some of the questions <laughs> Should that not be the tip for the Sorry. clue if it, if it can't be discussed <laughs> to the adults? 
<laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, they should have put it around the teachers and seen how many answers they get back. Excuse me, Miss, can I ask you a question? How many uh, times? You know, I mean, it's just, you would be expelled. You, I mean, yeah. if you did it, if, I, I'd put a tweet, and you know, joking. So if you went to your, your HR lady tomorrow and asked her, you know, how many times have you had anal sex in the last 12 months? You'd be sacked yeah. on the spot. You'd have a sexual harassment case against you, bloody. It's an absolute nonsense. Um, guys, the other thing we've got to go, because we're running out of time as always, um, the Scottish budget, which was we've highlighted, had nothing in it for a referendum bill, draft rent, or white paper, anything. Um, and if that isn't a tip for a clue for you guys out there, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, 23. It. It's, it's like you know the, the Iraq war with that wee guy. There, you know we are we are in control with the American tanks were passing by. This is that moment, folks. There's going to be no 2023 referendum, but the budget, um, you know, the, there was nothing great in it. Ian, did you see that got you tickled your fancy? No, not at all. No, what about I, you? I really don't. I, I don't want to say any more because, frankly, you know, it's it's a waste of effort. You but know, what about this allowing the councils now are, allowed, are going to be able to, the reins are off the councils to allow them to charge whatever they like in council tax now. We had a great discussion <laughs> the other week yeah, about uh, ground rent. But is this is this political? Is this so that they can use it in the council elections or are they seriously letting them loose because they've been... No, I think they're wanting to hope that, you know, some councils will be, you know, do something stupid and then they can blame the whole thing so it's political. the councils. Of course it is. I mean, the bottom line is they should have taken the opportunity many years ago to change council tax for a local income tax, which would have been fairer. Or they took gold. The, yeah. oh, well, obviously ground rent, that's what I would really want. But I'm just saying they took cold feet then, you know, and it's been a mess ever since. Mm. And, you know, the only way it's ever stayed there is because there was a freeze on increases. Mm. Now, you know, that dam is breaking. Local authorities need more money. Yeah. So handing it back to the local authorities is a very sneaky way totally. of giving them, giving them the blame for it all get up rather than the central government. Yeah. So, you know, who have failed to bring in a, a fair and equitable system. And it's their responsibility to do that, not local government. Correct, but surely, Phil, there would be more money in the pot if we didn't have all these false prosecutions delaying the census, which has cost us 23 million quid, or all these daft six surveys, etc. There might be a bit more money in the pot that they wouldn't force people to raise the council tax. It's as if we've, it's as if our governments in Scotland's learning from the centralised government in London. <laughs> um, they pass the buck and say, you're responsible for it. Here's, here's a diminishing amount of money every year to spend on the critical elements that you've got to pay for. And the Scottish government have just done the same with the councils. So you're like, okay, there you go. You take control of this. On you go. See what you can make of it. But they also forced them to say, they also gave them money and said, but you must spend it on this. They said, they told them things that I had to spend the money on. So I, I've got a lot of sympathy with the councils. Um, but guys, the clock's beating us, because I've got a couple of things I'd like to say, but to you viewers, if you haven't, and I meant to say this at the beginning, and I meant to say it every week, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit the subscribe button, the like button, the wee bell, so you'll never miss another show. Gentlemen, we've come to the end of this particular episode, show, I don't know what to call it, get together, chat, chatette, what do you want to call yeah, it? Yeah, well, well, a couple of things that were said there that, that really resonated with me was the, the, the fact that I've had no compunction or urge to go out and campaign for anything without independence what is the point and and, and the whole what we talked about the the on the positive note about building bridges <coughs> and putting people back together on the same track towards an independent nation that's that's the only thing i see that's that is really worth fighting for at the minute because sniping each other ain't helping and no, I'm, I'm absolutely disgusted with what's going on just now well, I'm going to say, I didn't want to say to but it's not you're both as bad as each other. That's just not true. And it's, it's up to the SNP. It's not true. Of course it's not. And it's up mm. to Nicholas Sturgeon. It's up to people like Peter Wishart and others who have been vile and nasty and attacked all about every opportunity. It's up to them to put out the hand, clear the decks and say, can we all work together? Because if not... Because we're going to have to. Yeah. If we don't, we're, we're, you know, 10 years from now, we're, we're doomed. We're all doomed. But anyway... 
my comrades in arms, um, I thank you. Playing golf tomorrow? I know you cancelled your golf today, Ian. No, I'm not playing until Monday. Oh, there you go. Well, life's tough. Life's tough. And what about you? Well, I'm coming home next week, so you'll be, you'll be seeing me back oh. in Scotland. So. Yeah, well, well, I might have a wee surprise for you all next week. I might have a very, very special guest folks, for you next week. Um, Good. And uh, uh, until then, all of you and yours, please, please take care. <laughs>